What's up, everybody? My name is Shane Kohler, and this is The Conscious Love Show. Thanks so much for joining me here, where each week I'm sharing true-to-life insights and experiences from my journey and how I've created the loving and committed partnership I have today. I answer your questions and have live discussions with you so I can support you in your specific situation. And I bring in experts and people who know their stuff so we can all learn from their perspectives. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you'd leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love. Hey, what's up, everybody? Shane here, and I'm very excited to be back with you today for another episode of The Conscious Love Show. Um, In today's episode, I'm going to do something a little bit special. So some of you may know, I might have shared it here or there, but my wife and I are in the middle of a huge move right now. We've spent the last couple weeks moving across the state, and it's been quite the undertaking. So instead of recording a new episode today, what I'm doing is I'm bringing back an old one. And this episode is one of my favorite episodes that I've ever recorded. It's one of my top listened to episodes of all time. Um, When I was thinking about which one I wanted to bring back, it was kind of a no brainer. It was like, yes, this is the one. Um, This message is so close to my heart. And I really think it speaks to the essence of what love is and how to create love with another person and how to experience more love in your life. So I'm really excited to bring this one back to share it with all of you. Um, I know you're going to love it. I know you're going to enjoy it. But I look forward to uh, seeing all of you next week and being back with you with a fresh new episode. All right. So I hope you enjoy it. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Conscious Love Show. This is, I believe, episode 12. So we're rocking right along here. Um, I actually, while, while I'm on that note, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Those of you who join me live on Instagram every week, those of you who faithfully listen to the podcast, I was mind blown when I found out that seven episodes in or something like that, we were already ranked in the top 1% of podcasts. And that's just based on the amount of downloads and the number of listeners And I just want to say thank you to, you know, it was, I mean, this has been something I've wanted to do for a long time and it's just been amazing to, to see it grow so quickly. I get messages from you constantly. You send me messages saying, you know, thank you for the show and get so much value from it. And I just want to return that thank you to you and just say, you know, thank you for being loyal listeners, for joining me every week. Um, yeah, just just thank you so much, and it was it was just so humbled and mind blown to see that it was like seven or eight episodes in, we were already ranked in the top one percent of podcasts. Um, so just thank you so much, and and that's all I have to say about that. Um, today's topic is I want what's best for you. I want what's best for you, the ultimate relationship mindset. I want what's best for you the ultimate relationship mindset. And, you know, the the idea for this topic was sparked actually by a song I've heard. Some of you may know Jason Mraz. He's, he's a recording artist. Um, in the Inspired Love program, we have a playlist of, it's like, it's like positive vibe music about love that I encourage all of the students in the program to listen to because it, it's just, it's such an important piece of, vibration is music and when we when we listen to music we align with the music we listen to and i remember my wife shared a story once where she used to listen to like adele and listen to all these like beautiful songs but that were like really deeply heartbreaking and one of her friends pointed out to her one time is like you listen to a lot of sad music and my wife was like you know what you're right <laughs> and so she, you know she turned a corner when she heard that and she stopped listening to sad music and you know, it's, it's been a big thing as we designed the program and we were thinking about what went into this is we want people to vibe with really positive music. I say all that to say that Jason Mraz is one of our favorites. We've, we've gone to see him live and, and he's just, he's amazing. And a lot of the music on the playlist is from him. And I was listening to one of his songs the other day and uh, it's a song called You and I Both. 
And I just want to share some of the lyrics in the song. He says that you and I both love what you and I spoke of and others just dream of. And basically what he's talking about is he's talking about this relationship, this partnership that they have and the dreams that they share together and the love that they have for that vision and that dream that they're sharing with each other. And um, it was in, in the song, he says something towards the end of the song. And, you know, he's, this whole song is about the dreams we share and the love we have and how much we love this vision and this dream and everything we're creating together. And then at the end of the song, he says something. And I've always been so touched by what he says at the end of the song every time I've heard this. And it's kind of counterintuitive. Like when he says it, it almost sounds like it goes against everything the song is about. But what he says is, it's okay if you have to go away. Just remember the telephone works both ways. And if I never hear it ring, I'll assume, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he says, if I never hear it ring, I'll assume that you've found someone else. And that's okay. Because I'll remember everything we shared. And I've just been always so touched by that line. Because I think it, it so much is what love is about. And so many of us, and those of you who follow me or listen to the podcast, you've probably heard me speak about this many times, is that, you know, so many of us, when we approach love or when we, when we want to find love, we're not doing it in a loving way. And today I'm going to get into what that means and what that's about. So the topic for today is I want what's best for you. And that this is the ultimate relationship mindset. In my program, Inspired Love, which by the way, I want everyone to know, I've been shouting it out. Um, Inspired Love will be open for enrollment in January. So um, I just want everybody to be ready for that because we're going to open for enrollment. Um, just so you know, when we do open for enrollment, calls get booked up very quickly. And you know, it's like, it's me and my team and it's all we can do to take these calls. So um, so I, I just want you to know that if, if it's something you want to do, get ready for it because we're going to open. Calls are going to get booked up quickly and we can only accommodate as many people as we can get on calls with. So it's just going to be important if you want to do it to as soon as we open for enrollment, get going with it. And that's going to be January 1st, we open for enrollment. But anyway, that, that aside, in the program, we talk about the holy relationship. And that's a term I get from A Course in Miracles, which I'm sure many of you have heard me speak about as well. But the holy relationship is a relationship based in giving. It's a relationship based in giving. In I am here to give what I have to give. And I'm here to give it fully. I'm here to give it completely. And I'm only giving it to someone who genuinely wants to receive it. I'm only giving it to someone who is open-heartedly receiving it. Right? So this isn't me trying to push this on somebody. But this is me being the living embodiment of love in my life. And, and, and non-discriminatory, what's the word I'm looking for? Like non-discriminatory, by the way. It's not like I love you because I like you. And so I'm giving you all my love because I think you're really hot and sexy or I think you're really awesome and I want to be with you. No, I, I'm that way with everyone doesn't mean I'm necessarily, you know, physically intimate with everyone or, you know, obviously boundaries are okay. But the love that's in my heart is given freely across the board. There's nobody who's left out of that. And because I show up to life that way, people start to want to be around me a lot. People start to want to be in my space a lot because they feel something when they're around me. This supersedes looks, intelligence, all the superficial stuff. This supersedes all of it. Now, I'm not saying those things are not important. And, you know, that's a little bit of a different topic. But I'm not saying those things are not important. They are and they matter. You know, you want to be attractive. You want someone to think you look good. Like, yes, of course. But this is bigger than that. And, you know, if somebody was... If somebody had 10 people who were all of relatively similar attraction, they would want to be with the person who made them feel something special. 
They would want to be with the person who makes them feel something different than what all of those other people feel. And the way you get somebody to feel that way is by genuinely wanting what's best for them, not what's best for you. Now, I want to expand on that idea for a moment because I firmly believe that what's best for them is what's best for you. I firmly, firmly believe that what's best for everyone is best for everyone. So if, if you and I being together is not the best thing for you, it couldn't possibly be the best thing for me. And that requires a lot of faith because our egos are very much about what I want. Our egos are very much about like, gimme, 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 gimme. And our egos are very much afraid of being deprived, of being forgotten, of being abandoned, of being discarded. And we have all kinds of inner child wounds and things, and this is all tied together. But our ego is very much afraid of not getting what I want and feeling like I need to go secure it for myself. And the ego operates over intuition. So you may have an intuitive sense on some level that the relationship isn't right or it's not, it's not the best fit for both of you. But if, you're, if your ego is so much about gimme, 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 you're not going to be able to let that intuitive sense land. And you're going to cling to the relationship. And I, I want to say that this isn't about not having an ego or not having these egoic experiences. Because most of us, me, you, all of us who are in this conversation right now are not going to have no ego. Or it's, it's not like we're not going to have these experiences of, of clinging, of wanting, of, of desiring. Of course we're going to have these experiences. So it's not about not having them. But it's about being able to rise above them. It's about being able to view the situation in a different perspective. And in the holy relationship, it's what I was talking about in, in Inspired Love. This is ultimately the aim that we work towards is how do, you, how do you manifest a holy relationship? How do you create a holy relationship? So the holy relationship is this mutual giving and receiving on both sides. But there's no taking it's not give me what I want from you. It's we're, we're in love. Not, it's not even I'm in love with you. It's we are in love, period. We are living in love. And out of the love we live in, there's a sharing that happens because the love is moving through us. And so if we're in a partnership, the love is moving through me into you and the love is moving through you into me. And because each of us individually are living in love, there's a, there's a continuity. There's a giving and receiving, a free flow of love moving between us. But it's not about give me, give me, give me, or I'm not getting my needs met, or I need this, or I need you to do that, or you need to be more of this. Or, that's all ego stuff. Now, this is an incredibly nuanced topic because I, I understand, I can already hear all the questions in my mind, and I'm sure when we get to the Q&A portion, people are going to have some questions about this. So I can already hear all the questions. This is an incredibly nuanced topic, and I'm going to do my best to break down and clarify some of the nuance here. But when you start getting into give me this, give me that, you're not doing enough of this, you're not doing enough of that, I need you to meet my needs, why can't you do more of this or that? That's all ego. That's all ego. The authentic self is not like that. The authentic self is not needy like that. The authentic self is not pushy like that. It's not trying to take what somebody doesn't want to give. Now, I want to speak into one of the nuances here because, for example, my wife and I will have conversations. We had a conversation last night, actually. We did, um, we're doing an ad, a couple's advent calendar for, for Christmas. So it's like counting down the days to Christmas. We each like pull a thing each day and there are like different exercises for us to do together and, and, you know, try different things that we wouldn't do otherwise. And the exercise for last night that we did was, um, 
we each wrote down five things we would like to do more often with each other and, and then talk about how we can do those things, right? So this is a great example of like dreaming together is really what it was, right? It wasn't us coming together and going, I need you to do more of this, or I need you to do more of that, or you're not meeting my needs, or you're not. It wasn't like that. It was like dreaming together. It was like, hey, what if we could do more of this? What if we could do more of that? Hey, what if we wanted to spend more time doing this? Like, what are some ways we might do that? And it was like dreaming and creating and, and building a life together. But it's not out of anger or frustration or being deprived or, or I'm not getting what I want and you need to fulfill that. That's all ego stuff. And that stuff destroys relationships. So let, let's talk about how this looks in the context of dating for a moment. If you're, if you're coming from, I want what's best for you, right? I'm not here trying to get mine. I want what's best for you. Now I can imagine like, okay, in a, in a misunderstanding of this distinction, in a misunderstanding of this, what you're going to hear is, so I'm just supposed to let people do whatever they want and have no say about it. Or I'm just supposed to let people walk all over me. Or I'm just supposed to be endlessly giving to others and they take and take and take and I never get anything. That is what you will hear in a, in a misunderstanding of what I'm saying right now. So let me, let me be clear. That is not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, Going into, I need you to meet my needs. I need you to do this for me. I need you to be different or be better is that's not the way to get your needs met is the thing. That's the way to drive people out of your life. You see that that's, we think, we think by doing that, by we, we get these ideas and, and I know like it, we've, we've all gotten a lot of bad advice. Like one of the, one of the things that I think is one of the worst exercises is to sit down and make a long list of everything you think your partner should do and the way it should be and how it should all look and then go out and try to make that happen. Like it's just a horrible exercise. And the reason it's a horrible exercise is because you don't know from your current frame of reference, how all of that's going to look like. And when you like, let me put it this way. The reason it's a horrible exercise is because it's an egoic exercise and you're in a vibrational state of desire, which is not love. Desire is about taking. It's not about giving. So you're in a vibrational state of desire, sitting around thinking about all the things you want and then going out and trying to make that happen with somebody you're not going to see the, the person or the relationship for what it is. So this would be a good time to talk about the opposite of the holy relationship, which in A Course in Miracles, it's called the special relationship. In, a, in my program, Inspired Love, I often refer to it as the ego entanglement. It's a different way of saying the same thing. But the special relationship, some of you have heard me talk about this, is this desire or this need to use you to make myself special, right? So if I make this long list of things that I want and I want to, I want to do this and I want to say this and I want to be like this and I want to go here and do this thing and that thing. And I want a partner who's going to text me every moment of every day and I want or whatever I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating here. Right. But when we make this long list of things we want, and then we go out and try to make that happen with someone, what we're basically doing in the ego is we're saying, this is the list of things I need to feel special. And now I'm going to put the burden of this on someone else and make it their responsibility to make me special. And I, I want to say, and, and please forgive me if, if what I'm about to say is a little heavy handed. Um, I'm not intending to be offensive in any way with what I say. But I'm just speaking in generalities. Of course, there are many exceptions to every rule. Okay. There are lots of exceptions to every rule, but I'm just speaking in generalities culturally and, and what I've seen and, and what I work with. And women often feel special by getting commitment and men often feel special 
by getting sex. And that's, that's kind of culturally, and of course, depending on where you are in the world, what your culture is, that could vary a little bit. I live in the United States. I've, I've grown up in the United States, so this is what I've seen here. I know there are versions of this in other places, and there are also things that are very different. But when we, when we go out to seek specialness, what often happens is a man is looking for someone he can hook up with. Let me get that hit of validation. If I can get her to want to have sex with me, if I can get her to make herself available for me in that way, I'll feel like, oh, I'm a man. Yeah, all right. I got mine. And women are going, if I can get someone to commit to me, if I can get someone to want to be with me long term, if I can get someone to love me, then I'll feel special. And so this man and this woman will enter into this interaction with each other. He's trying to get laid. She's trying to get him to commit. And neither one of them are being authentic with each other. Both of them are showing up thinking, what do I need to do to get what I want from this person? And it's a manipulative game. Now, I want to say, like I said, there are exceptions to every rule. There are definitely situations where those roles are completely reversed. But it's less common, I think. But regardless of that, the only reason I bring that up is to give an example of how the special relationship works. We show up saying, let me get what I want from you to validate me, to make me feel special, to make me feel like I'm enough. And my entire strategy in this relationship is to figure out how I can get what I want from you. And what ultimately ends up happening over time. Now, sometimes in the beginning, both people are willing to give and take from each other in a, in a way that allows it to really just kind of link up and they just kind of like stuck together. And, and, and then, you know, that's when we have hours and hours of sex and passion and, you know, fantasies and dreaming and, you know, every now and then it links up that way. And that's when you get this, this really hot, heavy rush of endorphins and oxytocin and and all this stuff that, you know, gives the feeling of being in love. But if it doesn't evolve into something higher, if the relationship doesn't evolve into something greater and it stays at the level of us making each other special, what's going to happen is slowly your partner is going to, honestly, sometimes not so slowly, but you know, over time, your partner is going to be less and less able to validate you the way they could in the beginning and you for them the same way. You will start to resent each other for it. And it will slowly eat away at the relationship that you have. And, and every, everything that was good about what you had, everything that was, like all the real potential that was there, all the real love that was there, because there usually is some element of real love involved, will get chipped away at, dissolved away, and you'll end up resenting each other. And then the ego will start saying to both of you, find someone else that you can get what you want from. Or sometimes what happens is the ego says to one person, find someone else that you can get what you want from. And and it keeps the other person desperately clinging to that person. And that becomes just a horrible situation for, I mean, really both people, but more specifically the one who's still clinging. And what we need to really understand and, and, and the point of this is that love is not created that way. Love is not created by trying to go out and get what you want from someone. Love is created by recognizing how much you have to give and by becoming the living embodiment of giving love in your life indiscriminately. Maybe that's the word I was looking for earlier. (laughs) indiscriminately. I said non-discriminately or something like that. But so indiscriminately across the board, right? It's, I am being love because it's who I am. It's what I am. It is the most authentic thing for me. I am being love because I couldn't be anything else. 
I want to speak into um, a video I, I put up. I've, I've actually put this video up a few times. It always gets insane reactions. And, you know, the, the question, uh, somebody asked me this question. They said, um, they said, I've been dating this person for eight months. I haven't heard from them in four days. Today is their birthday. Should I message them? And I said, yes, you should message them. And here's why. You should message them because you've got to decide what kind of person you are. And the question is, are you somebody who's going to send someone love on their birthday or are you not? And the answer to that question has nothing to do with when the last time they texted you was. Now, if I, like, let me just put this, I mean, it was a, it was a one minute video, so I wasn't able to get into all the nuance of it. But let me just put this in context. If I were in this person's situation, if I were in this person's situation and I had been seeing somebody for eight months and they hadn't messaged me in four days, and I don't know if this person had tried to reach out to them in four days, like maybe neither one of them had messaged each other. It's funny what we'll do, right? I just want to bring up that point. It's funny how we'll sit around, not reach out to them for four days and then complain how they haven't reached out to us. It's a very good example of the special relationship right? I'm not bringing what I want to bring to the relationship. I'm sitting back and waiting for you to bring it to me so I can feel special. It's a really good example of it. But let's just say hypothetically that I had tried to reach out to this person. I had tried to connect with them. So we've been dating for eight months, haven't heard anything from them in four days, and I've been trying to reach out and they're just ignoring me. Okay. If that were me, I might say something like this. I might say, listen, um, I know today is your birthday and I want you to know that I'm wishing you a happy birthday. And I'm also aware that for whatever reason, you're not responding or you're not being in communication with me. And, you know, I want you to know that whatever's going on, I'm open to talk about it and I want you to have a happy birthday. But if I don't hear from you, this is probably going to be the last time I reach out. I might say something like that. And, you know, that would be, that would be me showing up in love, wishing them a happy birthday. See, it's like, and, and being honest about it, like this isn't, this isn't a manipulative game. And if you're using it as a manipulative game, then you're missing the point. See, this isn't a manipulative game. Let me wish you a happy birthday. So you'll respond to me. So you'll make me feel special. No, this is me from my heart. I really, really want you to have a happy birthday. And even if we're mad at each other right now, even if we're not talking, even if it hurts right now, I don't want you to not have a happy birthday just because of that. I still want you to have your birthday. And I would love for this relationship to continue. I would love to talk. And if you don't want that, then I want what's best for you which is the topic for today. I want what's best for you. The ultimate relationship mindset. You see, if we've been dating eight months and you've gotten to a point where you just don't want this anymore, your heart is just not in it. You just don't feel it. Like one, I would, I would hope that what we've created in the last eight months is open enough that we could just talk about it. Like first, I I would hope that, but even if that's not the case, I want what's best for you. And yes, the loss might hurt. The loss might be sad. The loss, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to grieve this. I'm going to have to, you know, take care of myself and love up on myself and go get my friends to love up on me. And, you know, like I'm going to have to care for myself. Like I'm going to have to go through my process with it. But I don't want to keep you in a situation you don't want to be in just so I don't have to go through my process. Like, How fucking selfish is that? And so many of us, and this was me for a lot of years, and I really want want everyone to hear, there's no judgment here, but we just got to talk about how it is. So many of us are showing up to love like that and then wondering why love isn't happening for us. And it's not happening because nobody feels love from us. I want to share a personal story from my relationship, my marriage. And, you know, this is like, this is real what I'm about to share. 
you know, many of you know, I've shared about it many times that my wife uh, went through cancer treatment last year. She went through chemotherapy and then she went through another therapy after that. She was, she was going through like intense medical treatment for an entire year. She lost her hair. I mean, you know, she got incredibly, incredibly sick. She's, she's doing great now. You know, she's regaining her health day by day. She's better and better. But this was, this was definitely the most challenging thing we've ever been through together. And it was not easy for either of us. It was, it was monumentally difficult. But I remember a conversation we had one time and, you know, this, it had completely taken over our entire lives and we were both suffering a lot as a result of it. And I remember her saying to me, like, I want you to go out with your friends. I want you to go do yoga. I want, she was like, cause I had just been home taking care of her and like playing video games and just like waiting around, like for her to get better. And she's like, I want you to go live your life. I want you to go do your thing. And what I said to her was, I'm afraid to do that because I'm afraid if I start doing that, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be having so much fun that I'm not going to want to come home. And what she said to me was, if that's the case, then I don't want to keep you from that. I want everyone to hear that. That's love. Like, that's love. And just so you know, like, that didn't happen. I didn't go out and run off and never want to come home again. That didn't happen because there was something stronger than that keeping me in this relationship. But that's love. Her willingness in the middle of her own cancer treatment to still want me to be happy. And I want to say, like, I was there for her. I stayed by her side. I was with her through the whole thing. I'm still with her. But her willingness to offer me that, that's love. And this is, this is five years, no, five years. This is going on seven years into our relationship. And some, some people won't even be that way at seven months. And I want to say my wife and I have the relationship we have today because of that. Because of that. And that's, that's an element that we both bring and have brought to this relationship. I remember my wife, um, some of you have probably heard me share that I'm more of an anxious attachment style. My wife is more of an avoidant attachment style. So, you know, our relationship from the beginning has been me like constantly inviting her into more intimacy and her kind of being like, I don't know, let's take this slow, which was very good for me actually, because it, it, um, it kept me interested, right? It kept me like into this. So I I think it it was very, very good dynamic for us. But in the beginning, in the first, in the first year, she tried to break up with me like 10 times. I'm not even kidding. And it wasn't like she wasn't doing anything wrong, by the way. She wasn't being any kind of negative way. She was just having her experience of growing into this relationship with me, growing into deeper and deeper levels of intimacy. And it was scary for her. It was terrifying for her. I mean, she had been divorced once before and her divorce was like really tragic. I mean, her her father turned against her and it was just like, it was awful. And like, she just, she had a lot of trauma and she was really scared to get that intimate and that close to somebody. Plus we were long distance. We were, you know, on a three hour plane ride apart from each other. And we would only see each other like once or twice a month. So she was like so afraid and she was having so much come up and she kept trying to leave me. (laughs) And I remember every time she would try to leave, this is what I said. I said, if that's what you want to do, if that's what's right for you, then I totally respect that. But I just want you to know that I'm here and I'm going to be here if you continue to be here. And every single time she chose to stay. But I want you to know that if I had been all in my anxious attachment stuff going no, please don't go. Like, oh, like she would have left. She would have left. And, and not because there was anything wrong with her, but because I was making what I needed more important than what she needed. And that's not love. 
And she would have felt that from me and she would have not felt safe in the relationship. I, I've recently, um, I, I, I was coaching a guy. We just, we just uh, actually wrapped up. Um, we had our last session last week. But I, I've been coaching this guy for about, about six weeks now. Sorry, we got some background noise. Uh, I think the Amazon truck's outside. But I was coaching this guy for about six weeks. And this guy hired me because he was a, a like, um, admittedly a commitment phobe. And he had just started another relationship with a woman that he really liked. And he had this pattern. He's about 40 years old. And he had this pattern historically of every time he would get involved with someone, he would start to feel suffocated. He would start to feel like they needed more than he could offer. And he would just, he would just start to freak out and pull away. And, you know, something that, uh, so anyway, he, he started seeing this woman and he's, you know, he hired me to coach him because he's like, listen, I, I really want to work through this. I don't want the same thing that happened in all my past relationships my entire life to happen again with this person. And what I actually coached him on was telling her, communicating to her what's going on for him, his fears, his commitment, and asking her if she could work with him on this. And this woman, and she, I, I haven't met her, I've only known her through what he, sh what he says about her, sounds like a really amazing woman because, you know, she's... She's done a great job of making sure that he's not full of shit, which is important, right? So she's done a great job of making sure that he's not full of shit, but also giving him the space to take as much time as you need, figure out how you feel, figure out what you want, and let me know. And because of how she's been with him, he started coming to her saying, I want to make this more official. I want to start spending more time together. I want to take that trip together. Because she created the space for him and let him know that I want what's best for you. And if you decide that this relationship is not it, that's okay. I want that for you. This is so, so important. And I want to speak into one more nuance about this, and then maybe I'll open up for some questions. And it's, it's something I mentioned with, with her that I was just talking about, is that she, she made sure that he wasn't full of shit, which is important, right? You don't want to do this for someone who's full of shit. So you want to know that. But once she knew that he was sincere and that he was doing the work and that he was figuring his stuff out, she was willing to meet him where he was with that in the same way I was willing to meet my wife where she was. Okay, you know, my wife told me that she never wanted to get married and, you know, because of her divorce and because of how that happened. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I get that. But I also knew that she was serious about having a relationship. And I said, you know, is that something that you think you could be open to? You know, like I get it. You might be afraid, but and she would say, well, you know, with the right person in the right situation. Yeah, maybe. So I knew, I knew she was open to it and she was just going through some things that she was going through. Same with this guy, right? He was, he wanted it. He was open to it, but he was just going through what he was going through. And same with me and my wife, same with her and him. It was important to create the safe space for this person to experience their process and be able to work through that without feeling imposed upon. So when you, so I see the question, someone's asking, how can you tell if that person is sincere? And I get that. That is the big question. And I'm going to say that there are a few things here. One is having a strong connection with yourself and a strong 
emotional core. Because the truth is, is that you can't really know if someone is sincere in the very beginning. But you know they're sincere by how they show up over time. And so if somebody is saying, like, let's, let's just take this guy for example. and let's, let's say what it might look like with, with how he was showing up and then how somebody else who's not sincere might be showing up. Okay, well, what did this guy do? Well, one, he hired a coach. I mean, that's a pretty big step. Invested a good amount of money with me too. It's a big step, okay? Um, he was communicating with her clearly about what he was going through. He was moving forward in the relationship, even though it wasn't maybe at the pace that she might have wanted or somebody else might have wanted, but he was moving forward in the relationship. Like I remember one of, one of his biggest hangups and one of the reasons he was a commitment phobe is because he, he, he was a very big business person and, and anytime he would get into a relationship, the demands of the relationship would start to take so much time away from his business that he would feel like his business was suffering and that was his primary commitment in life. So he, he would feel like, you know, if I have to choose between my business and, and a relationship, I'm going to choose my business. And so this was his deal and this was why he always ran away from relationships. And something he started to do with her, or, or this, was a, this was what I was going to share, was she had, she had said that he, she wanted to take a, like a, a trip with him for like four or five days or something. And he was feeling that, and this is something he brought to our coaching call, is he was feeling that like that fear of like, okay, you know, this is what's always happened in my past relationships. Everything's cool, but now she wants to take a trip. I've got to take four or five days off work. You know, that's going to put us back on our deadlines and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'm just, I'm feeling a lot of anxiety around this. This is, this is why I don't get into relationships. So this is what he brought up on our coaching call. And so what we, what we worked through was do it, you know, make it happen. Like take the trip, rearrange your work, rearrange your stuff to make it happen. I talked to him about how to work through his anxiety and stuff. But then what he did was he went to her and said, so initially he was like, I don't know if I could take the trip because of blah, blah, blah. But then he ended up going back to her and saying, okay, I want to take the trip. I'm ready to do this. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to take the step. So the way you know if somebody is sincere is by how they show up to the relationship over time. And, you know, yeah, someone like me who, you know, I've, I've just always been a relationship person. Like I've been kind of ready to dive in from day one. You know, I, I just, I love it. Right. But someone like him, who's not a relationship person is a little different. He's like, okay, like I got to take it slow. But the point is, and this is what, this is what you want to look for to know if someone is sincere is one, is their honest, open communication about what's happening for them. Like he was telling her, like, listen, these are my fears. I'm afraid to take too much time off of work. I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to give you what you want and keep my work happening. And so, you know, is there open, honest communication about that? And I want to say, if you want somebody, especially a man, to be open and honest and communicative with you like that, you need to be able to hold that kind of communication without freaking out. So when he says something like, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to meet your needs and keep up with my business and all of this, and, and I have a lot of anxiety around this, when he's vulnerable with you and shares that with you, you've got to be able to hold that without getting triggered yourself and going, oh my God, he says he's not going to meet my needs. This isn't going to work, like, right? Like that's when, that's when he needs you to be that space for him. And that's what she was able to do for him. So, so first thing is, is there open communication about it? Second thing is, as time goes on, and by the way, this, this had all happened in the first three months of them dating, okay? They hadn't been together for a year. But as time goes on, are they stepping more and more into the relationship? 
even if they start slow. Even if they start slow. So, you know, you may, you may be, if you're, if you're more somebody like me, it's like, I want to dive in, right? So you may be somebody like, I want to text all the time. I want to see each other three times a week. I want to have romantic date nights. I want to have, and they might be like, look, I, I, I can only do like once a week, right? That's all I can do right now. So even if it starts slow, are they stepping in more over time or are they putting up a brick wall? that stops the relationship here. I was coaching a woman. This is a really great example of this. I was coaching a woman. um, We worked together for quite a while, uh, but, but she, she started dating this guy. And in the beginning, he seemed great. Like I I even said to her, I go, he seems like a really great guy. You know, he was, he was doing all the stuff. He was planning dates. He was making himself available. They would see each other multiple times a week. They would cook dinner together. They, you know, they would, and, and you know, there, there were a lot of things that were really great about this guy. And I told her, I was like, this is a really solid connection. You should definitely explore this. Well, she ended up dating him and, and they got involved in a relationship situationship kind of thing that went on for almost a year. I remember, um, we had a, we had a conversation about it. And, and, uh, we both agreed that after, after she had finally ended the relationship, it took her a while to come to terms with it, but we both agreed that about six months in, she had everything she needed to know that this was going nowhere. And then she chose to hang on for another six months after that, which is totally okay. Sometimes that's the process we've got to go through. But this is a really good example of somebody who's kind of the opposite, right? Where he was kind of all in in the beginning. Let's go on dates. Let's spend time together. Let, you know, he was a kind of all in, but then he put up a brick wall and, and he's like, this is the limit. Our relationship can't go any further. And he even said some things like, I will never live in the same house with you. I will never, you know, I like they both had kids. He's like, I never want our kids to meet each other. Like there were just some really big red flags that were kind of like, okay, this relationship can't go anywhere. So this is a really great, actually, I want to, I want to contrast these two people because this is excellent. So the guy that I was coaching, who, who I was, I was sharing with you about, he started off slow, but he worked with his fear. He worked with his anxiety. He was communicating openly about it. And he was stepping more and more into the relationship over time. Then there's this other guy who's starting off faster, is more into it, is more like showing the green flags kind of thing. But when it comes down to it, he's not prepared to go the distance. And I think what a lot of us do because we operate in our egos and we operate in our fear and we're so much about, I want to get what I want and I'm so afraid I'm not going to get it. And I'm so hypersensitive to anything that looks like a red flag and I'm unwilling to be in that discomfort with someone. I'm unwilling to have my own discomfort and be with that and, and be with someone else's discomfort. We look at someone who shows those green flags early on and we think, okay, this is the one and we attach to them. And then somebody like this other guy who might actually have more real long-term potential, but he's not diving in head first right away. And we're like, oh, he's non-committal. He's, he doesn't want the same things, right? So we've got to be, we've got to be wiser than that, to be honest. Like it's just, and we've got to be willing to be with the discomfort. Like, I want to go back to what I was sharing about how, you know, my wife tried to break up with me 10 times in the first year together. Like, yeah, I acted cool about it, but I wasn't cool about it. Like I I did a good job of being cool with her, but it was tumultuous inside. Like, you know, here I am, like, here's this woman, like I'm in love with her. Like, I really want this relationship to work and she doesn't know how she feels. And I was, I was like mature enough and wise enough to not dump that on her and make that her responsibility to deal with. Because if I had, like I said, she probably would have felt like this was too much and she couldn't handle it. So I was wise enough and mature enough to not do that. But I definitely had my own discomfort around it. And there were times when I talked to her about that and we talked with each other about it. And there was an open communication about it. You know, the entire, really actually up until 
the point where we agreed we were ready to get married. And this was, I'm trying to think of when this was. I remember the night. I'm just trying to remember what year it was. I think it was 2018. So yeah, it, it was October. I think it was October 2018. So this is, this is almost two years into dating. The, the, the foundation that we were operating on was we are exploring this partnership together. We both really like it. We both really want it. We're exploring what real potential there is and how far it could go. And either of us has the freedom to leave if at any point we feel that that's what's right for us. And we operated on that foundation for almost two years until we decided, do we want to get married? And I remember having a conversation one night where I asked her, you know, are you ready to marry me? And she said, yes. And then it was maybe a couple months later that I proposed. But so like, I want everybody to hear that. Like we lived in that gray area for over a year, like close to two years. And I'm not saying that everybody has to do it for that long, but I think at least a year is important. You know, people who are, people who are making lifetime commitments in the first couple months, like that's scary to me. And I, and I, based on experience have rarely seen it work out well. And it's not, it's not loving. It's, it's really not loving. Because coming from love, I want to give you all the space you need to determine how you really feel about me. I want to give you all the space you need to know if this is what you really want. Like, I'm asking you to make a lifetime commitment here. Like, like I'm asking you to dedicate the rest of your life to being with me. Like, and, and I expect you to do that in a couple of months. That's really selfish. And, you know, a lot of times we, one person's not too sure, but the other person is really pushing it and they don't want to lose the person. So they're just kind of like, okay, fine, I'll go along with it. And then it blows up in their face six years down the road. And, you know, like, I think the essence of this, and, and I want to really get down to the essence here. The essence is that what's meant to be will be. And what's not meant to be will not be. And all your manipulative games to try to skew it one way or the other way or make it this or that, it's, it might delay the inevitable. You know, if you force someone into a commitment they're not ready for and they just go along with it, it might get them committed to you for a few years where otherwise maybe they would have left in a couple of months, right? So it might delay the inevitable but it's not going to make that person want something they don't want. It's not going to make that person feel something they don't feel. And so all of this trying to push it or make it happen in a certain kind of way doesn't really work. What works is showing up as love, showing up as the embodiment of love, the embodiment of generosity, the embodiment of givingness and seeing who shows up in my space ready to receive that, right? If somebody's being noncommittal, if they're, you know, not consistent about making plans, if they're not consistent about texting back and forth, like, you know, like I'll share about my wife, you know, yeah, she was honest about how she was scared and she didn't know if she wanted this relationship, but she was also consistent with texting me every day. She was also consistent with booking trips to come visit and me booking trips to go see her. She would also host me in her house for two weeks at a time when I would go to New Jersey to be with her. So like, yeah, there was open communication about the things we were not sure about. And there was also committed action happening every step of the way, right? So if somebody's not showing up with committed action, well, they're not ready to receive the love you have to give. And you don't have to be mad at them about it. Just let them go. 
just, hey, you know, like I'm, I'm showing up with a lot of love to give and clearly you are not somebody with a heart to receive it. So I'm going to wish you the best. I want what's best for you. And if what's best for you is to go out and have a thousand casual relationships with a thousand different women, go do it. Like rock on with that. And I hope you have a hell of a time doing it. But I'm going to keep my love ready for someone who's open hearted enough to receive it. And I want what's best for you. And I also want what's best for me. And I know that what's best for me could not possibly be something that wasn't also what's best for you. That if I were to deprive you in any way, that I would have to also be depriving myself. So that's the message for today. I want what's best for you, the ultimate love mindset. (laughs) And, you know, living this, like I said, indiscriminately, it applies to everybody. It's not just about who you want to have sex with or who you want to be in a relationship with or who you think is hot or who you think is awesome. It's about everyone all the time. It's about, it's about being the living embodiment of love and then trusting that as you live into that and as you embody that, the vibrational nature of the universe will bring that back to you and it'll show up in a loving partnership, but that's not all. It'll show up in amazing friendships. It'll show up in amazing work relationships. It'll, it'll pervade every single area of your life because that's what love does. The more you give it, the more it comes back. The, the stronger you embody it, the more every aspect of your life starts to reflect it. And so show up to all your relationships thinking, I want what's best for you. And knowing that when you make a point to have other people get what's best for them, you are setting yourself up to also get what's best for you. But you don't have to be in your ego about, gimme, 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 let me get mine. Okay, I've seen some questions come in. I've seen some questions. So I wanna take a moment and uh, and just scroll through the questions, see what's there. I'll start with uh, some of those. Those of you who have questions, um, you can go ahead, start posting them in the chat. I'll get to as many as I can today. I'll go for about 20 minutes or so. Um, I also want to say a couple of you have bought badges. I want to shout out. Um, we have Belly Fimbres. Is that Belinda Fimbres? I think it is. Hey, Belinda. Good to see you. Awesome. Awesome. Good to see you on here. Uh, Belinda and I used to work together. She's amazing. I always liked you. I'm glad to have you here today. Um, okay. Let me see who else bought a badge. Uh, I know just Jensi I saw bought a badge. Thank you. Just Jensi. Yes, there you are. Long time listener. Good to have you back. Um, all right. Let me see anyone else. Those, those, I shouted out a couple people earlier, but those might be the only ones. If I missed somebody, apologies, lots of love to you and you matter. I just didn't see your name is all. Um, so I just want to say about the badges, badges are a way to give something back. I said this earlier, you know, if, um, if you're listening right now and you feel, uh, you feel inclined to want to contribute, want to give something back, the badges are the way to do that. And just know from my heart, it's, it's so much appreciated that, that you're here with me today and that you feel inclined to, to give something back. So thank you so much for that. And that is much, much appreciated. Um, I see Don bought a badge. Thank you, Don. I see Sergio Goldenberg bought a badge. Thank you, Sergio. Um, okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Arist, who is this? Oh, oh, Artist Load Escarter. (laughs) I don't know if I'm saying that right. Uh, Says you're very eloquent in your explanations. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of love and thanks so much. Um, Okay, I see we have a question from Reds40. We have a question from Don. Good to see you again, Don. Um, 
All right, and then I've I've seen a few other questions come in. So I'm going to I'm going to do my best. Um if you want to purchase a badge, now is a good time to do that. Go ahead, you just hit that little button. It's like a little stamp that has a heart on it. You just hit that button and that's how you buy the badges. If anybody wants to do that, now is a good time to do that. And um I'm going to start with Red's 40 question. Um is it healthy when someone wants space continually? Do you consider seeing other people because maybe they are not wanting your love? All right, so this is a great question. I want you to remember what I said about when the commitment is real, they will step more into the relationship over time. So it's not about how intense they are right out of the gate, but it's about does the commitment become greater over time? You know, so do they start like, you know, I'll just, I'll go back to the example I was sharing about this guy I was coaching is he started saying to her, Hey, I'd like to see each other a little more often. You know, maybe we can make time a couple more nights a week. You know, I would like to, I would like to take that trip you wanted to do, you know, I'll make that happen. Right. So he was stepping more into the relationship. When the commitment is there, somebody's going to step more into the relationship. So if somebody was continually wanting space, like, Look, I mean, my wife and I were married. We live together. We spend a lot of time together. We also take a lot of space, okay? Uh, we we have a bedroom that we share, and then she also has her own room, and I have my own room, and we spend a lot of time in our own rooms. You know, there's nothing wrong with having space. But if the person is, like, wanting space to the degree that they don't even want to see you, or they don't even want to be with you or or they're or over time they want to be together less and less rather than more and more you know like that that is a sign that there's probably not any real potential there and what was i going to say um what what i would do in in your situation is i would just ask like i want I want everybody to hear this. Like, it's okay to just ask. And when you're asking from, I want what's best for you, rather than asking from, I want to get mine, it's going to be received well. Right? And, and I mean, there is the possibility that you're just with someone who's really manipulative and they just turn it around on you and, you know, shame you for it. But if that's happening, then you just need to leave. Right. So if, if that's how that person handles it, when you ask, then you just need to leave. But a genuine kind hearted person, when you ask, you know, so if, is it health? The question is, is it healthy when someone wants space? Do you consider seeing other people because maybe they're not wanting your love? Like if I were in that relationship, I would say to the person, I'd say, listen, you, you know, it seems like in the last few months or in the last few weeks or whatever it is, you've wanted a lot of space. And if you need that, I totally respect that. I totally get that. But I was wondering if maybe we could just check in and and see if we even want the same things overall. Would you be open to just like having a conversation about that? Because, you know, in, in the kind of relationship I imagine, we don't really have this much space. And is there something you're going through that, you know, you just need some space right now or... Is this how you imagine the whole relationship is going to be? Like, is this what you want in relationship? Because if that's what you want, I want you to have that. But it's probably just not going to be with me. Right? I want what's best for you. Ask from that place. And people will probably be open to having an open-hearted conversation. And if they're not, if you ask from that place and they're not open to that, then, I mean, that probably shows they don't have the emotional maturity that you're looking for. Like if they can't even engage in a mature conversation like that, when you're not putting pressure on it, then they probably lack emotional maturity. And you could, you could, you could say like, Hey, Hey, look, if if it starts to get a little heated or a little intense, you could say, listen, I'm not trying to fight with you right now. I'm not trying to upset you. But it is important that we be able to talk about these things and be able to figure this out together. And if we, if we can't even do that, then I guess that's an answer in itself, right? So you could, you could diffuse the situation like that, 
but then invite that person, listen, can we have an open hearted conversation about that? And if not, then I, I mean, that's my answer right there. So lots of love, you know, I, I think, I don't think it warrants go see other people right now, but I, I think it might warrant an open hearted conversation coming from your desire to, you know, have what's best for both of you. And, and, you know, be willing to let each other find that however that looks. All right. Lots of love. Awesome question. Thank you so much. Um, Dawn's question is, how do you handle a guy that just met two dates and starts to make sexual comments on regular text interactions? Not sure how to handle this. Looking for an authentic long-term relationship. Okay. This is a great question. Now, there's definitely a line of appropriateness, I think. And, and that line might be a little bit different for each person. Some people are not that sexual. Some people are more sexual. If you're a more sexual person, you might be a little more comfortable with where that line is, or that line might be a little further out for you. If you're a less sexual person, you know, maybe that line isn't so far out. And so you've got to, you've got to honor yourself in that one. But I want to, this, this actually is a great thing. I remember I was coaching this woman. She was actually one of my first relationship clients. This is back when I was just doing like kind of regular life coaching. And she was one of the first clients who hired me specifically because she wanted a relationship. And she's actually happily married right now, by the way. She, she has the most amazing love story and I won't get into details, but I'll just say she met her now husband in Paris, the last night of her vacation at the hotel bar, they exchanged numbers. They learned each other's language over Google translate while talking to each other. And then like three years later, after having a long distance relationship, he moved her to Paris. Now they live together. They just had a baby. It's like one of the most amazing love stories I've ever witnessed. But anyway, um, she's one of my first clients and she, um, I, I, I had the same conversation with her. Because she was so, um, she was so offended by men making sexual comments or making sexual, you know, thing, things like Don is talking about. Like she would just get so triggered by this and so offended by this. And I asked her, I said, well, let me ask you a question. When you imagine your ideal person, your ideal partner, are they sexually attracted to you? And she said, well, yeah, they are, of course. And I go, I mean, you want to have a sexually active, passionate relationship, don't you? And she said, well, yeah, of course I do. Right. And I said, okay, so then a man being sexually attracted to you is actually a green flag. Like it's actually something you're looking for. Now, if that person is completely inappropriate, or if that person is crossing all kinds of boundaries, or if they're being really pushy after you've communicated your boundary, then that's, that's one thing. I get that. Okay. So like, you know, that those might be deal breakers, but somebody expressing sexual interest or sexual attraction, and especially as a man. And like, I think I'm pretty, I think I'm a pretty conscious man. Like, I, you know, and, and I have been, I've been spiritually minded and I'm not saying this is right or wrong or bragging about this in any way, but as a man, like if a woman was willing to have sex on a first date, I would go for it. I wasn't one to go like, oh no, I, I think we should wait. Like that, that's not who I was. And, you know, now I'm, I'm a little older, a little more mature looking back. I can see that doing that definitely has its pitfalls. Doing that definitely has, you know, some, some negative repercussions. But, you know, I was like, I just think of myself when I was dating, I wanted a relationship. I was like a genuine, good hearted guy. And I was also like very sexual. And I think being triggered by somebody's sexual interest in you is something that you need to work through. Now, if somebody is crossing boundaries, like I said, that's a different thing, right? So, you know, like, let, let's just talk about some examples. If somebody starts sending you dick pics, like deal breaker, in my opinion, all right, like that person has no class. In my opinion, for any of the women I coach, I'm just like, that dude is not worth your time. If he just, you know, 
un, unrequested just starts sending you dick pics. Okay. Like, yeah, deal breaker in my opinion. Um, you know, if, if they're like, if they're like constantly pushing it. Okay. So maybe, maybe they send you some sexy or some flirty texts or, you know, when you're messaging each other, they're, they're like, you know, you're really sexy or something like that. I mean, in your first few exchanges, I, that's kind of borderline. All right. So first few exchanges, if, if they're like right out of the gate, like you're so sexy, I wonder what you look like naked or, you know, I don't know what they might say, but if in your first few exchanges, they start being that way, that's borderline. That's like in my, what I would say to do with that, if they're not, it's, it's hard. I mean, it really depends on what they say, I think, but if it's, if it's flirty and sexy, but polite, I think that's, that's where I would say the line is flirty and sexy, but also polite. If it's that, then what I would do is I would create a boundary. And, and I would say something like, listen, I, I really love that you think I'm attractive and I really love that you're into me, but we're just getting to know each other. And, you know, maybe we haven't even met in person yet. Maybe we're just texting each other. Like, I'd really like it if you could hold off on that until we get to know each other a little better, right? Say something like that and see if he respects it. Because it, the fact that he's sexually attracted to you or sexually interested does not mean he's a bad guy as long as he is able to be respectful. And so what you're really looking for is, okay, when I create a boundary, like I remember, I remember my wife, you know, we, we got kind of close physically the first few times we hung out and, and she communicated to me that she was not ready to have sex you know, we would kiss and we'd fool around a little bit, but she was like, I'm not ready for that. And I, in my mind, I said, got it. And I never even brought it up, never even pushed it. I waited for her to say she was ready. So like that's in my mind, that's what respect looks like. It's okay for him to show his interest it's okay for him to communicate his interest. I mean, you want him to be interested there. My wife and I were just talking about it. There are a lot of husbands that are not interested in their wives and that's awful. Like that's horrible. That sucks, right? So you want somebody who's attracted to you. You want somebody who's interested in you, but what you want to find out is, can he also respect your boundaries or is he going to keep pushing it? Um, another thing I would say as a big red flag is when he starts putting his hands on you on a first date. Or even like, a, even like a second date, if you haven't, like on the first date, if you didn't get physical and then like second date, he starts putting his hands all over you. Like, in my opinion, that's kind of an invasion of like privacy. Like that's, that's an invasion of like personal space. It's like, we haven't taken that step yet. I haven't invited you into that space yet. And you're just taking it upon yourself to like put your hands on me. That in my opinion is an invasion. So, you know, now if you've kissed already, if you've, you know, done anything kind of physical, then you've kind of opened that door. Now it makes sense. So I, I, but I think the presumption to like, you know, I just met you, we're just sitting here at the bar having a drink and I'm like putting my hand on your leg. Like that feels like a violation to me that, that feels disrespectful. So those are some of the red flags I would watch out for. But I, I think the biggest thing is communicate your boundaries and see if he respects it. And if, if he does, then you probably got a, a decent guy, you know, in my opinion, at least, at least as far as that's concerned. So that's a great question, Don. I'm glad you asked it. Um, it's a, it is a good question. Um, okay. I'm going to scroll through here. I have time for maybe one more question. I'm going to, I'm going to see which ones we got. Um, I just want to shout out anyone else who bought a badge here. Um, let me see. I don't know if I missed anybody. All right. It doesn't look like I missed anyone. looks like I got most people. Um, I'm, just give me a second. I'm going to read through some of these questions and then I'm going to, I'm going to pick the last one to answer. Um, all 
Okay, I'm seeing a few questions here that are kind of similar. Um, so there's one that says, I've been seeing a guy for six months. We were communicating every day. At month four, he said he needs to go, go sure. He wasn't sure our beliefs are compatible. Okay, that's that's a great one. Um, and then there's another one here. Friends for two years, he made a move and two months in says he doesn't want to put a title on this. What does it mean when men say that? So these are two really good examples of what I was talking about earlier. I, I can't say for sure what he means or what he doesn't mean or what he's feeling. But this is where you've got to do exactly what I've been talking about today, right? So start with, I want what's best for you. If, if, you, if you need to go slow, you're not sure our beliefs are compatible, got it. So like, I would explore that. I would explore that. Like, so, okay, I get it. Like, what beliefs do you think are incompatible? I'm, I'm really curious about that. You know, like, what is it that you feel like wouldn't work long term? And also, and also, like, if you need to go slow, that's totally okay. Like, I, I don't have a need to rush this. And I want to make sure I'm not wasting my time, right? Like, it's okay to say that. Like, if you need to go slow... It's okay. I, like, I don't have a need to rush this, but I just want to know that I'm with someone who's sincere. I just want to know that I'm with someone who, who actually does have a desire to be here and build something. And if we need to take it slow, that's okay. Right. Um, in this other question, it was, he says he doesn't want to put a title on it. So I would explore that too. So what does, what does putting a title on it mean to you? You know, what do you, what is it that you're afraid of putting a title on it? Because I want what's best for you, but ultimately I'm going to, I'm going to want a title. So do you never want a title or are there just certain things that you feel like you would, you would need before you're ready to have a title? And let's just talk about it because I want what's best for you, right? So, so I need to find out if that's me or if that's not. And if that's not me, then, you know, maybe you need to go find someone who also doesn't want a title. You know, maybe you need to find someone, and speaking into the other question, maybe you need to find someone who has different kinds of beliefs. But I don't have the need to push anything on you. Let's just explore this with each other. Let's just have an open-hearted conversation about what's going on. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? And then you've got to be the space where you can hear things that you don't necessarily want to hear, right? When, when he might say something like, well, our beliefs aren't compatible, you know, I, I feel like we have different family values, or I, I feel like we have different interests. And in, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I mean, I would really want to know what, what those beliefs are and what, he, what, what is on his mind there. I would really be curious. But... Like that's where, you know, he might share some things that you don't want to hear. And that's where you've got to be the, be the space where you can be okay with hearing those things. And yes, it might be uncomfortable. Like, like I said, you know, when my wife, you know, in our first year wanted to break up with me a bunch of times, like that was uncomfortable, but I was also willing to be with it. You know, if, if I had, if I had turned around and been like, well, if you don't know what you want, then this isn't going to work. She would have been like, okay, I guess it's not going to work. Right. So it was uncomfortable, but I was willing to be with it. And I think that's the thing is ask questions, hear what he has to say, hear what's on his mind, hear what his fears are, hear what his doubts are, hear what his insecurities are. Be, be willing to receive that, be an open hearted space for that. And and then navigate that while honoring him and honoring yourself. And, you know, without, without going into more detail about what his answers would be to these questions. Uh, oh, oh, um, okay. I'm a bit more conservative and religious. No sex till marriage. Want to raise my kids in my faith. Thank you. Okay, got it. So thank you for sharing that. So I could see, uh, thank you. I, I, I really appreciate you sharing that. I can see why he might struggle with that, right? No sex until marriage. I want to raise my kids in my faith. Now, if he doesn't share those same beliefs or if he, you know, maybe wants to have sex before marriage or maybe isn't so committed to a certain faith, 
I can see why he would have concerns about these. And then again, it's, I want what's best for you. Right. And, and from him too, like, like if that's your, if no sex until marriage and, and your faith and all that, if that's your thing, then you deserve somebody who shares that. And I uh, mean, I want to, I want to talk about my mom right now because she's somebody who wanted that her whole life, but sold out every time. But I, I, I don't have time to get into it now, but but the point is, is that, you know, if that's what you want, you deserve to have that. And if he's not that, like he deserves to have what he wants. And so this is where you guys have got to, got to get a little messy together. You got to get in there. You've got to talk about these things. You've got to be willing to hear the things you don't want to hear. And you know what, like what can happen, I'm not saying this will happen, but what can happen is when you create that open hearted space for him, and he feels that you are really willing to let him go find what's right for him. He might actually have a change of heart and be like, you know what? It's not ideal that we wait until sex to have, we wait until marriage to have sex. Like that's not what I, that's not my dream. But you know what? I could be willing to wait because of how I feel with you right now. That's a possibility. And, you know, a lot of magic can happen when you really create this open-hearted space for someone with their best interest in mind. I'm going to end with that. These were fantastic questions. Thank you so much to those of you who sent your questions in today. Uh, I really enjoyed this episode. You know, like I said, I was listening to that song the other day and it just, it hit me like what a profound truth about love. And I really wanted to be able to speak into it. So I, I enjoyed uh, today's conversation. I love the questions. Thank you so much. Those of you who join me live on Instagram, those of you who listen to the podcast every week, uh, Conscious Love Show podcast is available on all major platforms. So please go subscribe, leave a review. Let me know what you think of the show. I'll be back here live on Instagram next Tuesday, sending lots of love, lots of blessings to everybody. And we'll see you back here next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love.